I do remote sensing, so that's not my specialty. And we started doing some remote sensing work uh, throughout Southeast Asia for studying mangroves. You know, what are the uh, degradation rate of mangroves and if there is any rehabilitation and so forth. Because unfortunately, there is no a uh, good map that exists that shows this, you know, the temporal distribution of changes in mangrove lands in all of Southeast Asia, in fact. And that's where really most of the mangroves of the world exist. So that's what my interest of coming to this meeting. Traditionally, you know, like biologists, botanists, they have been studying uh, a few plants or maybe a plot the only problem with that is that if, even if uh, you study a plot very well, you cannot just say that, okay, this plot is 10 meter by 10 meter, let's multiply by 100,000 and this will find out how this whole delta is doing. It doesn't work like that. So spatially there is a lot of variation. And it's not possible to study every tree, right? It's uh, expensive, time consuming, and just not practical. So another way of looking at things that are spatially expansive is using data from space or from aircraft, and this is where this remote sensing comes in. Now, NASA and some other European space agencies have satellites that go around the Earth and take data continuously. Some problem with that is, of course, those space-borne sensors look at large areas, and then you cannot, a lot of times, connect that, what the space-borne sensor is seeing to the field studies. So there's where come in the mid-level remote sensing, like using aircraft or field-based transects and scaling up from field to the satellite sensor so that you can have a good idea of what's happening in a large area, like for example, a delta basin, Mahakam Delta, and so forth, yeah. So that's how remote sensing is used. There are some sensors, like the optical ones, uh, are of course bound by or limited by cloud covers. So that's why we are looking at some of the time series. So you know, in an area there may be cloud cover today, but there may not be cloud cover tomorrow. So NASA has these satellites that take images from the Earth, from almost all of the surface of the Earth every day. So we are looking at those. Also there are sensors that can look through cloud, like radar. And then there are newer sensors like LiDAR that can give you an idea about the vegetation height. Because a lot of times height is related to vegetation health, biomass, and other characteristics. So a combination of different sensors are, I think, the way to go. Because radars and other sensors are quite expensive, and also they need a lot of power, energy, for running. So you cannot probably get radar coverage at a very good resolution every day, but you can get optical every day. You know, so combining this optical, radar, LiDAR may be a good way to go forward. Most of the NASA type of remote sensing is free, in fact. That's a good thing because this is, again, uh, being funded by the U.S. taxpayers. So, and most of the U.S. taxpayer-funded research is free, free to the users. So that's a good thing. But then, of course, like when you start flying with an aircraft, it's expensive. But I think there is an international collaboration now, so it's, it's doable, okay? Uh, in terms of some of the European space agencies, some data are free, some are not. But I think as the policymakers get more informed about the power, about the ability of remote sensing to give them some of the tools that they may use for policymaking, I think the cost will not be a big problem. It is still somewhat, but I think it's getting better, easier. Uh, hardware price is coming down a lot. Uh, there are more and more tr well-trained scientists. So I think it's a good time to kind of like, for the policymakers to look at these issues and make available data to scientists.